Okay, do we have a live person for doing this? I think it's you, Ron. Okay, I will continue to be. Make sure he's alive. I will continue to be the flag man. Uh, it, it's not on camera. Not not quoted. It's uh, a little bit off of the camera. You know what? We have a flag right up on the camera. That's okay. We have one on the camera. Okay. No, well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's time to pledge our allegiance to our wonderful country. And we begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Someday. Yeah, let's go ahead and see if we can unmute Marilyn. I'll forget my head. Thank you and welcome to the Tri Valley Democratic Club. My name is Jackie. I'm the president of the club. And tonight, instead of starting with my opening statements in honor of um, a poetry month, I have an author here, Marilyn Distra, Distra, who is passionate about walking in nature ever since she walked out the back door as a child growing up in the Finger Lakes of upstate New York. Now as an adult living in San Francisco Bay Area with her husband, she is combining her two passions of walking in nature and writing poetry. During the pandemic, her poem In Sickness and in Health won second place in the Effie Lee Morris Poetry Contest with the Net National Women's Book Association, San Francisco chapter. She has a BA with a major in Spanish from Northwestern College in Orange City, Iowa, and in a master's in comparative literature from the University of Iowa. Um, if you could join me in welcoming my friend, Marilyn, to start us out with some poetry. Marilyn, make sure you're unmuted. Thank you. All right. I've got to get um, up what I want to read here. First, I'm going to read my second place sonnet. It's not a traditional sonnet, but it is a sonnet. And our dog of hers is barking. Lois. Okay. We can't hear it. In sickness and in health. In youth, we hiked up mountain peaks, chased thunderstorms over passes, crossed knife edges in snowy patches, waded icy alpine streams that rushed downhill. Turning 60, my knee began to creak and ache, then replaced with titanium, plastic, and glue. You cooked, cared, and coached me back to health so we could hike through hills of purple lupin. But tonight, you lie in bed and wake me up to fetch our son to lift you out in dead of night to take a piss and to your face bring a smile or flinch. This morning, I lead you beside creek banks of poppies, waiting for thumps from my cane in your hand. And then I'd like to read, um, I guess it's not Women's Month anymore, but close enough. This is uh, what's called a haibon, it's a Japanese form of um, flash memoir followed by a short poem. In this case, it's a, called a tanka. In the middle of the 38 Muni bus. I was sitting on a 38 Muni bus with 30 commuters, all of us wearing masks. The bendy bus was only half full, but passengers had barely enough space to keep three feet apart. In front, the petite Filipina driver sat isolated behind a plexiglass partition. I sat facing the side door when a gangly white man got on and sat on my left. On my right sat an old white woman wearing a trapper hat and a camouflage quilted vest over a hot pink t-shirt. Over a cotton waffle knit top with gaping holes worn at the elbows and soiled around the frayed edges. The bus stopped. I switched to an abandoned seat behind the door. She got off. The old man complained that he could still smell that dirty pussy. He flung open the sliding window behind him as he shouted at other passengers to open their windows wide too. No one moved. 
At the next stop, an older black woman in a long black raincoat got on. She tripped over his feet in the middle of the aisle and directed a barrage of insults at him. He protested that she had stepped on his foot. She sat down behind me. The man stood up, grabbed the bar in front of me and threatened her. Trapped in the middle, I told him, sit down. The driver shouted a warning. Passengers looked up. I glared. He sat down. The driver announced the next stop. The man rose to get off, but turned to threaten the black woman again. My only weapon, my teacher's voice, sit down, I hesitated, or get off. He stood by the bus door in front of us, complaining how nobody was going to call him a bitch, that he was a man, and people needed to show him some respect, blah, blah, blah. The bus stopped, and he got off. I felt no pity. Passengers bent back over their cell phones. I looked behind me to check on the Black woman. Are you okay, ma'am? No answer. I raised my eyebrows and peered at her. She was slumped against the bus window with brows furled, eyes narrowed, and lips pursed. She could neither react nor reply, stuck between anger and fear. I turned back around and stared out my window. The woman got off at the next stop. I caught a fleeting glimpse of her black raincoat as the bus pulled into traffic. I stared through the window at a flash of her life. What story will she tell sitting in the middle between gender and race? And that's what I have to read here this, this evening. And I think that um, Jackie has a couple of haiku, which I'm well known for writing, that she might end the meeting. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so do you have um, any any published work that you would like to share in the chat? If, oh, you know, actually send it to me because I think I have chat disabled um, with these dual uh -huh. Zoom calls. But um, send me anything that you would. The chat is open. I will. I can put a link to my um, to my blog, and that has some more poetry on it. Beautiful. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. And uh, let's see, is it picking up the speaker view? Not picking me up. Hello, camera. Um, next up, um, Ellis, if you want to come up and introduce our next speaker, and I'll try to get the camera working again here for you. OK. Well, those of you who were here last week and uh, those on Zoom uh, know that there's going to be uh, a race to Senate District 5. And Senate District 5 geographically is, as far as I can tell, all of San Joaquin County and a portion of the Tri-Valley. In fact, it's most of the Tri-Valley. All of Livermore, um, Dublin, up to Dowerty Road, so Dowerty Road East, and similarly the continuation of Dowerty Road is Hop Yard, and it's Hop Yard East also in Pleasanton. So as far as I can tell, it's most of the area of Dublin and Pleasanton and all of the area of Livermore. It's also, as far as I can tell, the only game in town in the Bay Area. That's a contentious race. Of course, the race is next year in 2024. And at this point, there are three candidates, Democratic candidates for Senate District 5. Last month, we heard from Rhodesia um, Ransom. And this week, this month, we're hearing from Edith, and I hope I don't blow this. <laughs> He's smiling at me. Yakuda. <laughs> Did I get it up? Did I do okay? I've been practicing for two weeks. <laughs> and to make my life more difficult, one of her, her other opponents is Miguel Villapuda. And um, I asked her earlier, are they related? But uh, she's shaking her head yes. But I'm not sure how, and maybe she'll cover that curiosity. Not that it makes any difference. Uh, Edith's husband, 
who's also what's his first his first Carlos Viaputo is a member of the state assembly out there, and that's what Tracy area. Okay, so uh, she knows what she's trying to get into, and that her husband's been a member of the legislature for a while, and she knows the games that they play up there and uh, what's that what that's all about. Um, she's a realtor. And uh, I think that's a good thing because uh, I have found that legislators, although they come from a lot of different backgrounds, don't realize that it's a sales job, that when they're trying to get somebody to pass a piece of legislation, they have to go into their office and say, these are the reasons that you should pass that legislation and make the sales pitch. And the really good legislators are the really good salesmen. So without further ado, and also because I've run out of facts, <laughs> here's Edith. Um, I was going to show you how to Kathy. Oh, Kathy Bell? Brown. Brown. And um, I really don't know anything about Kathy. One of our favorite mayors from Livermore. <laughs> really, I didn't realize yes. that. But she's yeah, been, she's she awesome. lived in Livermore a whole life. Yeah. And, and, I know, I love Kathy. I'm, I'm, I'm a relative newbie. So, Kathy. All right. And you'll introduce me. Okay. And the iPhone is your camera and the speaker. Yeah. The iPhone, right? Yeah. This one. Okay. Yeah, you're right in the center of the screen. So, yes, I used to be the mayor of Livermore 20 years ago, and I was in for about 20. So, tonight, I'm here to introduce Edith via Poobah. My daughter works in Sacramento. She's a lobbyist and has her own firm. Called me in December and she said, Mom, I've met an awesome woman, woman and I really want you to meet her. She's running for your district, uh, District 5 for State Senate. And um, I think it was about January 8th. We got together and we met and this woman has hit the ground running. I mean, I, Amy was right. I love her. She's awesome. She has got, she has met with um, uh, elected officials, community leaders, and has really gotten to know some of the issues that are, are present in our valley to our, that are significant to our cities. And so I applaud you and all the work you're doing. Um, Edith uh, understands not only our issues, but a plethora of the broader issues. As a, as a, a woman, a, raising her kids, uh, working full time. She managed to get her um, educator, a higher education uh, by just by her, her strength and determination. She earned a um, BS in business, was it business management? For, um, wait a minute, business administration while she was working at full-time and raising kids. So I know she's got the talent to take on all the work she's got ahead of her. And um, Edith also has a, an, an amazing bat work background. She's worked with CalWORKS, a public assistance program for children in California. She's worked with families through their um, citizenship residency, work permit and K-1 visa process. Her range of experience also includes an investigator for the uh, Public Defender's Office and Public Guardian for San Joaquin, San Joaquin County. Edith also has experience in small business. She was a co-owner of a uh, American, Mexican American restaurant. And in 2021, she earned her, she got her real estate license. So my thinking is she's got another job to do besides all of those. My hope is her next job is our state senator. And with that, Edith, it's your, you're on. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Tri Valley Democrats, for having me here today. I really do appreciate your time. Um, I know there's people out on Zoom as well, so I just wanted to say thank you for uh, joining us this evening. Um, I wanted to give you a little bit of background of who I am, a bio. I know I've kind of touched a little bit here and there, but um, and it gives you the reason why I'm running for uh, state senate to be your representative. Um, I uh, was, I'm, an, I'm a child of an immigrant parents. They came from Mexico and they arrived to Southern California. Um, after a few years, um, they were able to buy their first home and get that American dream that they really wished for when they first came to the US. And so um, they were very, always very proud. Um, they were able to become citizens um, and they're very proud to vote in every single elections. And so um, I get that sense of pride from them and that work ethic. Um, I was raised um, in, a, in a very strict uh, Hispanic uh, Catholic household. And uh, when we came to Stockton, it was in 1995, I ended up um, living at coming to Stockton my it was back when uh, there was no cell phones and so my first introduction to Stockton was um, meeting my father at a, a grocery store parking lot and um, they coordinated the time and so we come out after just driving six hours from Southern California to to Stockton and we were stretching out our legs waiting for my dad to arrive when um, I was raided by a drive-by shooting so that was my welcome to Stockton, which was not the best impression to have. But I soon came to realize that, you know, gun violence is something that is everywhere, not just in a particular um, part of the state, city, or anything like that. So, you know, you just learn to uh, adapt and just be able to um, be cautious of where your surroundings are. Um, in 1995, I was in the middle of high school. So of course, like any other teenagers, nobody wants to uh, come out of, um, uh, go, you know, change schools, at, let alone in a different region of the state. But I made the best of it. I graduated from Edison High School in Stockton and, um, you know, decided that I was my as I mentioned, my dad was very strict. And so he wasn't allowing me to leave the home to go um, to further my education. So I had to stay at Stockton. And so I ended up going to a vocational school and uh, earned my AS degree in computerized business administration. Soon after I graduated, I started working for a nonprofit agency um, in the CalWORKs department. I was a case manager there and worked my way up to an immigration program coordinator for all four offices in San Joaquin and San Luis County. And that's where I was able to um, have the passion to be able to help people, um, whether it's renewing the residency card, getting a K-1 visa for their fiance or uh, work permits, as well as um, getting their citizenships and their residency because that's what they wanted to be able to live here legally. Um, I always proud myself and be able to tell them the truth. And it's unfortunate sometimes that's not what they wanted to hear if they didn't qualify. Um, but, you know, I was always very upfront with them to tell them that when, um, as much as you want to hear something, you know, and, and if you're not able to do it, um, you know, it's something that I wanted to make sure that they were aware. So um, at, by then I had already been married and I had my daughter. Um, I was pregnant with my second daughter and I ended up being, um, getting divorced and I became a single mom. And so I didn't have time to dwell. <laughs> so you just have to keep going because that's what you do as a mom. And that's what I did as a mom, I should say. And so I just went ahead and I started working hard and I realized that working at a nonprofit is not going to be easy um, because of always, there's always funding concerns. And with a mother of two, I, I needed to make sure I had a little bit more, something more secure. So I ended up applying and getting a position with the public defender's office as an investigator for them. Um, best 11 years of my life I had there. Um, every day was a different day. I was able to help people, um, you know, making sure that everybody has the right to be represented. Um, being able to 
um, make sure that if there's any injustice going on, if these um, police officers weren't doing what they were saying or the, the, the evidence was pointing to, that we were going to be able to uh, provide that information to the public defender so that they can then in turn, um, you know, have their legislative or their um, their day in court. And so um, half of the, the time that I was an investigator for the public defender's office, I had to go out to the county jail or other facilities. And um, there was times where I had to be escorted into uh, units or intake units. And um, I'd be escorted by correctional officers and they would say, you know, hey, why are you working for the dark side or the wrong side? And to me, um, I would always tell them there is, that, that, that is, there is no wrong side or, or, or the dark side. Um, as long as the police officers did their job, and if this person is being um, accused of something and there's evidence to support that, then they'll have to, you know, be able to, they, they will have to um, suffer the consequences. But if the officers didn't do that, if they didn't do the right thing and followed procedure that, you know, is part of our legal system, then we have to be able to defend that person and give them that right in court. And so, like I said, I loved having that job. Um, in the midst of all of this, um, I ended up, uh, obviously, before I even started the county, I was, I had already met my, my now husband, and he decided to run for public office as a county board of supervisors. And he, um, I was very supportive of that. And I helped him with everything and anything and everything about a campaign. So I organized walks, telephone banking, done fundraisers, collecting baskets, doing invitations, putting out lot signs, um, you name it, I, I've done it all. And so I know what it is, to, or I know what it takes to um, run a campaign and to win campaigns. And so that's one of those things that you can have that experience and nobody will be able to take that away. Um, I ended up having uh, my daughter, we got married. Uh, so we've been married 10 years, although we've been together for 19. And um, I ended up having my daughter. So I took some time off from work and um, I took care of her, ended up um, after about a year, went back to the private, back to work, worked in the private sector. And um, I, it, it just didn't have that fulfilling of wanting, I mean, of, of being able to help people. And that's what I really, you know, it was lacking. And so I really wanted to make sure that I got into a position that I, I'm able to help. And so then um, I ended up working for the courthouse in Stockton. Um, I still felt like I wasn't really helping. So I decided to apply for the uh, San Joaquin County Public Conservators or Public Guardians Office as an investigator for them. And I worked in the probate unit. Um, probate units working with our elderly community, um, usually at risk um, because they have some kind of neurocognitive deficiencies. And so we would get referrals, whether it's from a financial institution or um, adult protective services, things in that nature. And so I would have to go out and investigate to see if there's anybody that would be willing to take on that responsibility to be their fiduciary or to, to be their decision maker. Um, unfortunately, half the time, you know, they were being victimized by family, friends, or neighbors. And so majority of the time, our office would have to um, seek a petition through the court and ask for a conservatorship for them. And that's where um, I, I truly felt that I was doing the most impact of all. That's where I have a special, a special place in my heart for our seniors, because we were able to, I was able to be in the forefront and see how, you know, these individuals have had a history of things, you know, how they've uh, impacted their community and able to, um, you know, do all these things that you would see because you would see their homes. And um, I was able to take, um, you know, just wanting to take them home with me because you felt so hopeless. It's unfortunate that the probate um, uh, process does take a long time, but at the end of the day, we were able to get them out of their home and place them into a facility that would help them on a daily basis. And so that's the, the biggest and main reason why I'm running is because I want to be able to help. I want to be able to help our community. I want to be able to help, um, you know, just making things better. I know it, it sounds, you know, like every other candidate says, I want to be able to leave 
the place that I now call home, you know, a better place for my children. Well, it's not just my children. It's everyone's children. You know, we want to make changes that are going to be positive for them and be able to be inclusive to them. And so um, I know that there's questions regarding, you know, my experience as a politician. Um, I, I'm not a politician. I, 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 I know I've never held public office, um, but, you know, when my husband asked, because he was asked to run for the state Senate, you know, he's an assembly member, um, but he didn't want that. Um, he's happy where he's at now. Um, he can make more of an impact where he is now. And so he asked me, well, you know, would you consider running for this seat? And I was like, there's no way. There's just simply no way because I don't, first question, what were the first comment that I said to him, it was ended up the question. It's like, why would anybody vote for me? I've never held public office before. Um, and when I said that, I was like, wait, there is no manual that says that I have to be, there was a prerequisite of me being a public official before, uh, before that. I mean, so I decided, I was just, as soon as I said that and thought about it, I was like, you know what? why not? Why not me? Why won't they vote for me? I have lived experiences that I can bring to the table. Um, you know, people that bring um, a different perspective. You know, with my husband, I have seen how government works firsthand. I've been in the political arena in a sense, right? Because I've always been with him when he goes and volunteers, um, our children and, and I go with him. When there's events, we we all go. I, I go with him majority of the time. And so I know what these things are. I hear him on the phone. I hear him or, you know, read, uh, you know, certain bills that are being discussed. Um, not that he's asking me to, but when he does ask of my opinion, I give him a different perspective. I give him, I don't want to say necessarily, but I, a, a, a female perspective compared to a male perspective. We are different. Um, people can easily say, oh, well, she's just like her husband. Um, you know, you're you're married for so long, you you have similarities, of course, but by no means are we carbon copied. We don't agree with we we've learned to agree to disagree. <laughs> I think every marriage um learns that because you you can't get stuck on just one issue. But you know, there's things that I know I um, can say that I firmly believe in and not that he doesn't, but he may not be as passionate as I am. And so um, I want you to know who the, the person who's running for state senate is Edith. Edith is running for state senate. And that's one of my major reasons to always introduce myself as Edith, because I want people to get to know me first and be able to say, hey, um, you know, I, I I really like her. And then they might hear, oh, she's a Villa Pudua. <laughs> and and yes, there are quite a bit of Villapudas in uh, our region. Uh, obviously, my husband is one. Um, and you to address the question of about Miguel, yes, um, he is. He's not. Um, he is my husband's cousin. So it, you know, I can't control anyone. <laughs> I control anything except my own, uh, my own race. And I, you know, there might be other candidates, and that's okay too. It is an open seat. Um, anybody has the right to be able to to uh, put their name in the in, in the ballot, and you know, um, you know, the the public will decide, the voters will decide. And I am working really, really hard to be able to be your representative in the state legislature as a state senator. I'm already walking, um, going door to door because I know that's something that we need to I need to do to be able to learn what each person's what 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 your concerns are. Um, San Joaquin County is different than the Tri-Valley, and I know that I recognize that. Do I know every every concern that that the either of the two have? No, I don't. I don't pretend to know that, but that's why I'm gonna go out walking, knocking on these doors to get to know, you know, everyone and, and see what their thoughts are, what their concerns are, so that I could be a better, you know, I'm gonna be a, a good listener and be able to voice those concerns when I do go, when I do go up to the state senate, if God permits. So um you know, I, again, I really do appreciate your time. I know that there's might be questions. I'm more than happy to answer them. And um, I, again, thank you for your for your time. I, I truly do value it. Thank you. And, and please stay up there for a minute. I'm sure we will have some questions. I 
have chat disabled here. So first off, thank you. <laughs> For those that are on Zoom, um, I'm going to open it up to the floor here at the hall first, and then I'll circle back and let you guys unmute yourself. Um, you raise, do your raise hand function, I believe, I hope. Okay, so um, the first question, uh, Ron, and if you want to come up and uh, stand up and make sure you're like focused towards the uh, speaker, which is on the iPhone. Yes. <laughs> At least towards the speaker. Edith, <laughs> yes. Off. Off, so closer to this. Way, I'm not there. If you're off screen. I'm off screen. I'm that mainly is... worried about the, the audio. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Mainly the audio. Right. Okay. Stand next to the. Very good. I feel yeah. like nice yeah. Thank you. And I'm in the video now. So there we are. I, yeah, I can see. <laughs> okay. I'm an entertainer, so I'm uh, looking to be in the frame. <laughs> In any case, nice presentation. Yeah. Wonderful to meet you, and thanks for coming here to speak with us. I'm wondering if you can give us the three main priorities that mm -hmm. you will have if elected as a state senator from your district five. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Yes, I know that I gave more of a background information about me, um, but of course, um, I can say the platform is going to be one way today. Um, and, you know, as we all have experienced COVID, there's things that come out that you just have to adjust, right? So I can say today that my three platforms, uh, three main areas that I would love to be able to champion or to be able to fight for up in the state capitol would definitely be, you know, dealing with our mental health issues that we have, um, you know, I worked in the public conservators, public guardians office, and it was housed at VHS, which is your behavioral uh, health services uh, um, campus. And there I was, I saw firsthand for over two years, um, you know, individuals that came to the facility and needed the services that they, they um, desperately needed. Um, but there's also going to be individuals that just don't want the help. But we could definitely focus on the ones that do want the help. Um, and we need to make sure that we have enough staff and that's it, clinicians to be able to service these individuals. Um, there's, I received numerous, numerous emails of constantly requesting or trying to hire clinicians and they just weren't enough people, you know, getting those or being uh, those vacancies being um, occupied. And so we want to make sure that we can want to be able to help these individuals that do have the services, but we need to make sure that we can get the, in, the professionals to be there to um, answer their uh, concerns or be able to have their services um, be provided to these individuals. Um, mental health is something that um, is uh, has a you know has a stigma of you know nobody needs to be reaching out, but in reality, um, everybody should be checking in on on it. Family member, we may not be clinicians, but if we can check in with our loved ones to make sure that they're okay, um, I don't think that's a bad a, a bad thing. We need to make sure that we can have um, you know the resources for them as well, you know, and then also um, in San Joaquin County. We have a lot of individuals that come out to the Bay Area to work. Um, you know, you get the burnt end of it in the sense of the, the congestion that you guys have in, in the Tri Valley with all these, you know, cars being on the road. Um, when we saw COVID, um, you saw the congestion alleviate. And so you realized that, you know, there are people that are still able to work. You can work from home and you can be able to um, still earn your, your living. I'm not saying that that's gonna happen because there's a lot of the, uh, companies that want them to come back to work, but you know that there's something that is possible, um, but, but the infrastructure that we currently have is just not enough for, for everyone. You know, you have people that live um, out in the in the Central Valley, they travel about an hour and a half to two, maybe sometimes three hours, depending on traffic, you know, and these are the, these are the roads that they're using from here in the Tri Valley. So making sure that the infrastructure that we have gets improved and, um, you know, 
be just gets improved more and more, whether it's getting alternative um, transportation, um, you know, whether it's, you know, rail being for or a uh, barge or things of that nature. That's something that I need, would need to get more information on. Um, and then obviously um, with the whole um, mental health issues that kind of starts trickling in and goes into the homeless population. I do not pretend to know, to be able to have the answer to homeless. I don't think not one person does, um, but um, if we can work together and try to get more of uh, collaboration um, to be able to tackle some of these issues, um, majority of our homeless, um, well, some of our homeless is financial burden, right? They just don't make enough money to be able to have um, a house, uh, to be able to pay rent or to pay a mortgage. And so, you know, sometimes they live out of their car, but if we can get them some vocational training um, to get them into better paying jobs, that's something that definitely needs to um, be, you know, something that we need to work on and getting them lo more vocational training in um, in our area. And then um, the other segments would be the either mental health or the behavior, um, the substance abuse uh, counseling in that sense. Um, it, these are all compartments. These are all things that we need to be able to address one at a time. We can't, there is no magic um, answer. There's no magic pill. It's something that needs to be a collaborative effort by different agencies, all agencies that are willing to want to see a better community for our area. Um, you know, those are, you know, things that I really do want to be able to focus when I'm up in Sacramento. Thank you. Additional questions from the room? Do we have any questions online? Let me put up the gallery real quick. Um, I see some questions. Uh, first up, Igor, our chair from Alameda County. Hi, uh, welcome to the Tri-Valley BAM Club and uh, um, good to be with all of you remotely. Um, I um, uh, So I am not as familiar with your track record and I was hoping you could tell me and perhaps others who might um, have similar questions. Uh, uh, what, what is your overall stance on uh, standing with labor um, and your overall vision for growing uh, working class uh, jobs and turning them into middle-class careers? Of course, thank you for that question. Uh, your name is? Igor. Igor, thank you for the yes. question. Um, and again, thank you for having me. And by the way, Igor is the chair of the Alameda County Democratic Central Committee. Got it. And I'm an awesome guy running all over the state doing everything. <laughs> well, hopefully I'll get to meet you in person. Hardly. <laughs> Look forward to it. Thank you. Um, yes, I do not have a track record. I've never held public office. Um, and and um, you know, I, I think that's a good thing. I, I know that there's people that have been in, in uh, politics, you know, for a long time and they might see need as something that might be a little bit more, um, you know, pragmatic. Um, I, that's my lived experiences. So that's what I bring to the table. And so that's what I wanna be able to do. Um, so you, you are correct. There is no track record, but I can tell you that I am um, being supported by already by the Teamsters, our local Teamsters 439 in Stockton um, that are supporting me. And I'm hoping to get, you know, additional support through labor. Um, but I, I, that's going to only be a, determined by them, of course. Um, but, you know, we, I, I, I came, my family was from a middle class family. Um, I know what it is to, um, you know, my parents were not rich, but they were able to afford to purchase a home. And so I think that's um, everybody's 
hopefully, hopefully everybody's dream is to be able to have a place to call home. And by doing that is you need to have good paying jobs to be able to afford this. Uh, California is getting very, very expensive. You turn around, uh, my, my daughters are in college now um, and they one of them lives away from home. And she's like, I went to the store, I only got one bag and I, don't, I paid $60, you know? So it is expensive, but finding these jobs and making sure that the, we have, um, the um, skill set, especially out in uh, San Joaquin County, you know, making sure we get vocational training out there and getting them to be able to um, aspire to purchase a home or to at least um, want to be able to, you know, um, send their kids to college if they can, you know, and, and I am about I, I, I do want to make sure that we have those those type of jobs that will make it hopefully, you know, to be a one household income compared to now being having multiple jobs to be able to just make ends meet. So was I able to answer your question for you, Igor? Yes, thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, next up is Cheryl Elliott. Can you unmute yourself? Yeah. <clears throat> Hi, Edith. Hi, um, Cheryl. You have talked about that you aren't an experienced politician, um, but outside of being a real estate agent or an elected's wife, what would qualify you for such a high office um, in the state of California? Uh, for instance, what commissions um, have you served on? What legislative experience um, you have? outside of your husband and your knowledge from him? And what democratic clubs have you been a part of? Thank you for your question. As I mentioned, I've never held a public office. I've never been part of any boards or commissions. Um, I just bring to the table the experience, the lived experiences that I have. Um, you know, aside from, as you mentioned, um, my husband in office and me being around that, you get to learn firsthand. Um, a lot of things, just like Ella said, that is going on, especially out in the state of, uh, at the Capitol. And so um, I, I'm not, um, you know, I, I'm not uh, active in the uh, Central Valley Democratic uh, Club at all, um, because I feel I've, you know, just been helping him. And so that was my priority um, as far as, you know, being very supportive of my husband. Um, he's been in the, you know, been in office for quite some time. And so my, my time has always been on his campaigns. And that's why I, I'm able to say that I could help coordinate walks and telephone banking and doing those things um, that, you know, has been successful for campaigns. Um, and the next question is from our very own Samir. Samir, do you want to go ahead and unmute yourself? Hi, can you hear me? I can. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you, Edith, for coming and talking. I know two of the previous members have already asked the same question. I don't want to repeat the same question. Um, I do agree that, you know, for such a large office at the state level, you do need some public experience, including some sort of a commission and everything. So I think I'm sure that's the question that you, you're probably answering to everybody. But let me take it differently. Uh, one, I'd like to get clarity. I think, Ron, you were mentioning this uh, district includes Dublin and Livermore, I think Tri-Valley. So just curious how much of this district is part of Dublin since I live in Dublin. So I'm just trying to understand, then I'll ask my other question. Or maybe um, Edith can explain. I thought, was it Ellis that provided that? Well, yeah. can you answer if, uh, yeah. Dublin? Is that part of it? Is that it is. SD5? Correct. So is it, it all is. in Dublin? From my understanding, it is it's Dublin from Dowerty East. So you're talking the um, uh, 20, AD 20, the assembly I'm district 20. SD5. But I'm saying the part of Dublin that is is 20 is is part of SD5 too. Never mind. <laughs> so, so this, okay, so if it's Doherty East, that would definitely be my own district where I live right now. So one of the things that, uh, you know, you talked about commute time for people, mental 
um, wellness and everything. So question that becomes is, okay, uh, what are you, with your business experience, what are you thinking about economic development? You know, we have a big zone in Dublin that's up for, you know, uh, development and everything that's going to happen right off 580 and by Target. And there's other areas in the area, you know, in the district where you're running. How are you thinking about bringing new jobs, economic development in this such a large state office that you have? How are you going to help the local communities get more jobs or economic development in these areas? Well, yeah, I mean, um, as as you mentioned, it is it is a, a big uh, district, and obviously, uh, so you know, a district that you know you would be, I would hopefully uh, be representing in the state of, uh, in the capital, but um, getting the economic development, it's, um, I, as I mentioned, I, I do not claim to know uh, every aspect, right, as a business owner, because I am a business owner, as well as a real estate agent. I, I worked on, um, you know, I'm a bookkeeper, as well as, a, as well as an immigration consultant, but um, getting to know what the needs are of this area um, is how I would be able to answer that question. Knocking, you know, not knocking, but just getting to meet with other elected officials to see what their concerns are, how to be able to bring um, whatever new um, um, businesses that are wanting to come in um, and see what how, how I could be supportive of that. It, and if they don't want that type of uh, business in their city, then, you know, we need to figure out what would work for them. Every city is different and being able to um, get to know these individual cities um, and what their needs or what their wants are is something that I definitely want to be able to, um, you know, speak with them about. It is something that um, I know every every city is different, um, as well as, you know, uh, San Joaquin County. And I know out in San Joaquin County, they do try to bring more jobs out there. Um, you know, this area is fairly new, so I, I do not pretend to know what exactly these issues are in this Tri-Valley area, but I'm more than willing to get to learn what those concerns are. And our last question um, will be from Joseph in the line. And I'm sorry, I don't know your last name, Joseth, but if you can unmute yourself. Thank I'm you. unmuted. Thank so you. I heard your spiel about um, homeless. And I wanted to take, I wanted to ask your question is, since a lot of people, you know, they have trouble, they're on the streets because of mental health issues, you know? So it's not just can't get a job or things went wrong. It's that the support system is not there to help them be able to be functional. I want to ask, what would you change about that or do about um, that anyway? For sure, thank you so much, Joseph, for that question. As I mentioned before, you know, there's, um, there is a need for mental health clinicians to, you know, be able to staff those positions so that they can go out into the community and, and be able to help individuals that are homeless. Um, and they have to go out because typically they don't come to, you know, the behavioral health service campuses or anything like that. So being able to have enough staff to be able to do the work that they need to be able to connect with them um, is the first hurdle that we have to go through. There's so many things that we um, are in need. Yes, there could be um, millions of dollars uh, to address the homeless uh, issues. It's been you know, happening throughout the entire state, um, you know, and and we still feel there is there's no improvement. They're they're getting there. They're trying to build homes to be able not homes, but we try to build facilities so that they can, um, you know, be able to place individuals. But there's going to be individuals that don't want the help, and it's because they need that mental health services. Um, like I said, the the. First key is to get enough clinicians to be able to help them um, and be able to track them and monitor them because they won't come to them. So we have to go, well, we meaning the clinicians have to go to them on the streets and be able to uh, address their needs. 
Jackie, can I get one more in? Like Ron, get to the camera. She's online. I'm almost there. Uh, a couple of years ago, just before the pandemic, uh, this club passed the resolution, which was also passed by the Alameda County Central Committee, the Contra Costa Central Committee, and a handful of other Democratic clubs. And it's basically now a data up updated in light of the train disaster in Ohio, you know what I'm talking about, where the executives decided not to put in a braking system. Okay, they made that corporate decision. And now with they're polluting the rivers and they've made a mess of it. The resolution that we had, and I'm looking to see if you'd be willing to support it, the resolution said, that corporate executives who make decisions that would harm the health, safety, privacy, or the environment so shall be subject to criminal penalties. There are already civil penalties, but criminal penalties, as in handcuffs and jail cells. And I know that Congressman Desaigne is in favor of that, but I'm looking for potential legislators. Right. Could you get behind something like that? Um, I, I can't say I, I am or I'm not just because I need to get more information. I, it's, I don't know the specifics of the resolution that you are referring to. I, I, I don't want to blindly say yes, and then I realize that there's something that I have questions about. So I don't think it would be prudent for me to say it without knowing everything that is being addressed in this resolution. But I would definitely would want to read more about it. So that I could, you. yeah, definitely <laughs> to read more about, about it so I can be able to give a, a, a good answer for okay. you. Okay, that's an important statewide and nationwide issue. Right. And I understand that. So that's why I said, like, since I'm not as familiar, I would need to do my due diligence. Okay, and thank you. Yeah, yeah, as long as you're open to it. Yeah, it's good. yeah. yeah definitely. It, I, I need to be able to read to read it fully. Well, to be... to the books in jail. <laughs> <laughs> well, take 50 cents. I can see that. Yes, I understand. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and um yeah be careful of that wire that's just there to trip people up <laughs> um thank you so much and we will be having an endorsement vote at some point after we hear from the other candidate running and then we'll be inviting you all back to to do an actual endorsement vote <clears throat> so that ought to be interesting do we know when when everything closes through um, December 23rd is when the Secretary of State posts all of the candidates on the Secretary of State's website. Okay, thank you. So we will be looking towards the end of the year to do an endorsement vote for this seat. Um, next up, I would, yeah, or early January. Next up, I would like to bring up Richard, my Vice President, and he will introduce the next speaker. Thanks, Jackie, and thank you, Edith. Thank you for being here. Um, I uh, won't intro too long, but um, if anybody remembers last month's meeting, we had uh, the wonderful Miss Ann Jenks and Reverend Duran Jenkins here to talk a little bit about uh, their effort to establish sheriff oversight in Alameda County and some of the work that they've been doing around that. Uh, they presented a resolution uh, that was endorsed and supported by the Alameda County Democratic Central Committee. Um, we sent that resolution text out in our email prior to our meeting today. Um, and Jackie, I don't know if it'd be. Yeah, I have it. I thought I was so prepared. Sam, <laughs> I will share it here in a second. No worries. Um, and while Jackie's pointing that out, basically, we couldn't endorse, uh, we couldn't 
put it up for a support vote last um, month's meeting because of our bylaws, our organizational bylaws um, had some requirements that we didn't meet in time. Um, but we are going to be voting on whether to support that resolution tonight. And so I would like to, if and would like to come up here and answer any last remaining questions that folks might have, or maybe talk a little bit about it for anybody who wasn't uh, at the meeting last month. So Anne, feel free to come over here. Good evening. Uh, I have to thank you very much for uh, inviting us back this evening. Uh, my family is very pleased to have me out of the house so they can have the volume up. On the <laughs> so, um, so uh, Reverend Duran is on Zoom, um, but uh, I don't want to. I don't want to revisit our entire conversation of last month unless anybody has any particular questions. The Alameda County Central Committee has passed a resolution um, endorsing sheriff oversight. The problem with sheriff oversight is that everybody's for it. It's like mom and apple pie. But when you start drilling down, some of the board of supervisors wants an apple pie with no apples and really no crust. And so what we're looking for is robust, effective, strong, community-led, oversight that provides transparency, that has enough resources, uh, that has independent legal counsel. Um, the county counsel's office has the unenviable task of defending the sheriff's office against any legal situations they come up to, come up against. And it's wildly inappropriate for them to simultaneously be representing an oversight board that has obviously a very different set of interests than the defense legally of the sheriff's office. Uh, I come from Oakland where we have had civilian oversight of our police department. And um, it is part of the reason that we are, we believe that we see an end to uh, the federal monitorship that we've had for two decades of OPD um, because the judge is saying, we feel like the civilian oversight board is gonna be able to step in and fulfill some of that monitorship role. Um, and what we have learned is that there needs to be independence. There needs to be uh, an inspector general that's full time. There needs to be enough resources for the oversight board. And uh, the board of supervisors doesn't know this yet because to a person, they're pretty mealy enough about the issue. Uh, they're gonna love it when they have it because people are gonna stop showing up at the board of supervisors and yelling at them about what's going on in the jail and with the sheriff's office. And they're gonna start going to the oversight board for in-depth conversations and some actual action on it. So the board is gonna love it. They just don't love it yet, okay? And so one of the things that we're asking you to do is everybody's up for election next year with the exception of um, Supervisor Cam and uh, when you run into them, you've just got to ask everybody. They just need to hear because one of the things we hear is, well, we're not sure what the voters think. What I can tell you is that the voters in Oakland, which makes up not a small part of the county votership, have voted twice by over 80% in support of oversight in Oakland. And the voters uh, countywide voted for a sheriff who ran saying that she supported sheriff's oversight. Now that it's her being overseen, she's wobbling a little bit, but <laughs> we'll get there. She's going to love it too, by the way, because when you're trying to drive reforms and you need to explain to your deputies why reforms have to happen, you need a bad guy. And the oversight board is going to be her bad guy. And she's going to really appreciate that because it's going to help drive the reforms that I truly believe that she wants. Voted for a sheriff who said they wanted oversight and wanted reforms, and they voted for a DA that clearly wanted reforms. And by the way, has been legal counsel for the group that does oversight in Oakland. So I personally believe that the voters have expressed every which way they can, that they want strong, effective community-based oversight, but these supervisors need to hear it over and over and over again, and they need to hear it from different people. So talk to them once and then come back with a mask on, but keep talking to them. Yes, sir. Who are you proposing points or elects or selects or 
gets a, I don't know the right verb. Interview. Okay. Yeah. And the inspector general that you mentioned, uh, similarly. How, how does one get to there? Right. Um, so what we are proposing is that there should be a selection panel uh, that is appointed by the supervisors and that, that selection panel recruits and interviews people to be on the oversight board and makes recommendations to the board of supervisors who ultimately appoints. Now, Nate Miley has gone on and on to explain to me why that would take away his power. I tried to explain to him that rather than having the supervisors just go through their Rolodex and see who can I call to ask to sit on this oversight board, the selection panel, and we've seen this in Oakland, they're very, very thoughtful. They interview people. They look at the experiences of the last people to say, we really need to drill down on these issues in terms of who we're appointing next. They can balance it much better because they're appointing everybody, right? So you don't have all lawyers, but you want at least one lawyer, that kind of stuff. A couple of things that we would like to see. One is that um, current and retired law enforcement should not be on the oversight board. They have plenty of opportunity to be on, in, on the internal affairs departments of every law enforcement agency where they do a less than stellar job. Um, we're having that situation again in Oakland. Um, and uh, that it's very important to us that people who have been justice involved not be excluded from serving on the oversight board. They have a very unique perspective. And uh, some, sometimes boards say, if you have a criminal record, if you have a felony, you can't be on. And so we, and in fact- So, that, so it that. includes people in the justice system, yep. excludes the cops. Yep. And what about former DAs? Aren't they cops? No. <laughs> uh, I don't think that, no, it doesn't. I, we haven't proposed anything about DAs. I mean, the real reason not to have law enforcement, and this would actually hold true for DAs as well, but we just, I mean, you have to draw lines somewhere. Both law enforcement, yes. Well, the, the real reason not to have law enforcement is that anytime law enforcement is in the room and you're talking about law enforcement, they take up all the oxygen. Hmm. It's just, I mean, it doesn't matter. There are people that I keep, that I respect more or less for law enforcement, but when you're in a room with them, they take up all of the oxygen when you're talking about law enforcement. And this is about community oversight. They will work with the sheriff's office. I mean, what we see in Oakland, because we just, we have this experience now for, for several years, is they have a lot of conversations with the police, but they're community representatives and they have to come up with things that are- Is, is there some city that you could hold up as a, a great model and have a base that selection is the key to the whole yeah. thing. Oakland. Who, who gets to decide? Oakland. <laughs> Oakland, the bottom line. Oakland is the is the example. We have a selection panel. Um, and they are very, very thoughtful. They do extensive recruiting. Um, and uh, you know, and then so what would happen for the board is the board would then receive the recommendations and would give them, you know, and they make the final appointment. Yes, sir. And good stuff. Just a couple of uh, quick suggestions. One, can you for us tonight give us an objective estimate of what the annual budget is about how much money the oversight board would be uh, spending? So what we have proposed is 1% um, of the Sheriff's Department budget. There is a national organization of law enforcement oversight. It's called NACOL. And you know, it's important to have enough money. Uh, I will tell you that we are what we proposed um, standing here in a labor hall is for 1% equivalent to 1% of the sheriff's budget, but not out of the sheriff's budget because SEIU and NUHW represent people in the sheriff's office and they said you can't make a proposal to take money out of the sheriff's budget. On a practical level, it doesn't matter because if you take money out of the sheriff's budget, the board of supervisors is going to give them more. So it's a one percent. <laughs> oh no, the sheriff's getting a lot more than that. I think it's in the three million dollar range, Reverend Duran. 
So one percent. Yeah, is uh, you mean the sheriff's budget? Yeah. What's one? Is, is it like three million? Uh, it, it's about uh, four. The one four that million, one percent. One percent. Four one percent of four million. No, no. Four million is one percent. So four hundred million. Is, well, you have to hire. This is what you have to do. You have to hire investigators. You have to hire hire a uh, uh, inspector general. You have to do outreach. You have to do community education. You're 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 hearing discipline. You're hearing cases. They're not discipline cases. Discipline's the team. You know. I mean, it's a so it's a big it's a thing. With a lot of duties. And but staff. yes, and investigators. Because people make complaints, people get very excited to be able to make complaints outside of the sheriff's office. But the good news is you save money because there are fewer lawsuits if you can get a sheriff's department to stop some of the practices that tend to lead to lawsuits, such as people dying in the jail a lot. So you, you will save money in the long run. You mentioned internal affairs. How does that work with internal affairs? Is there going to be a, a, a fight or a battle between these organizations? You know, internal you, affairs and this. What you do is you set up mechanisms about you just say like the rule in Oakland is that internal affairs has to share information within 24 hours of you know receiving a complaint that you know things like that. What's now happening in Oakland? Is that the internal affairs, they're looking at essentially shrinking the internal affairs department and just having the oversight board investigators do most of the investigations. You have to have internal affairs because of a state law, but to remove most of their investigations because they do such an atrocious job, the interviews are an embarrassment where you get questions like, well, you. You thought she was over 18, though, didn't you? Which is a question in Oakland they had to ask a couple of years ago. And the investigator from internal affairs sure. encouraged the underage girl who was being raped by police officers to delete things from her phone so that she wouldn't get them in trouble. That's exactly what he said to her. That's what internal affairs does. And that's why we need outside of oversight. Mm -hmm. oh, so mm -hmm. many people are, should be selected to be on the committee. Recommending a certain denominator. Yes, we we we're happy to have those conversations. Um, it's much more. We're much more concerned at this point. Seven to nine is a good range. We're much more concerned at this point in the authority and the independence and the resources that the oversight board has. But you're driving it into existence, so you should make a recommendation. We are. Yeah. I, and can you make a recommendation that one of the members of your organization, since you are driving this, be one of those who sits on the board? How long did the, did the people get to sit on the board? What's the term? So what we, uh, we'd love to be dealing with this level of detail. We're really, I mean, we have not convinced the board of supervisors that there needs to be an effective oversight board. They'll tell you, if you just go up to them and say, are you for sheriff's oversight? Oh, yes. But when you start talking to them about independent counsel, when you start talking to them about who's appointing it, when you start talking about that, they get, they lose every bone in their body. So we're, well, we're not at the point of having those level of conversations. We do think people should term out. Yeah. We, there's lots of experience. There's, as I said, there's a national organization. We have Oakland where we have commissioners who have met with supervisors and done everything yeah. they can to support it. But right now, I mean, th there should be terms. They should term out. Right. Um, I mean, all of those things should occur. Right. But, um, but it's not wise to actually make those uh, specifications to go into that kind of detail on your input because the supervisors are just going to back off completely if you think that they're tying their hands by specifying the way that it should be structured. But this We are not absolutely, they think their hands are being tied. I don't think they think their hands are being tied. I think that they like the status quo. But, yeah. but it's not going to tie their hands. It's They're going to, trust me, the, the, the city council of Oakland is thrilled when something comes up with the police they get to say, well, this sounds to us like this is for the police commission. 
and we'll just have them come back and give us a report and some recommendations. And they're so freaking happy okay. to be able to dump it off on somebody who can do a better job, who can really delve into it, right? So the supervisors right now, they don't know it, but they're going to love it when you shove it down their throat. I think it's a good idea. I'm a strong supporter of it. I just think that it should be more detailed. I so people kind of object to it specifically or not. I, if I can get your email, I will send you some of the, some of the lengthier, yeah. more voluminous stuff. And we have a couple more questions online. I want to make sure to get answered, and then we will be doing a voice vote on this. So I think we have a question from John Bauer online. John, you want to unmute yourself? Trying. I'm trying. Okay. Am I unmuted? Yes, you are, sir. Okay. Great. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, so um, myself and my family, we have... Uh, I would say an unfortunate, unique perspective on oversight, championing for oversight, um, involved in a lawsuit with the Pleasanton police. Um, and so first off, my, my comment is that the county is gonna save all this money uh, because they don't have to pay out these millions of dollars of lawsuits. And our family was the recipient of one of uh, a significant amount um, because our son was beaten to death by 13 Pleasanton police officers on August 1st of 2018. And that money does not come out of the taxpayer's pocket. What I've come to find out is that cities, municipalities, there's insurance, there's reinsurance, there's reinsurance of the reinsurance there's state pools, there's county pools. So th th it's not a dime out of the taxpayer's pocket. It's not a dime out of the county supervisor's pocket. It's basically, they're insured for these losses. And so whether the lawsuit or the, the payment to the family is $100,000 or $20 million, it's an insured loss. So um, the argument of, you're gonna save this money in lawsuits. It, 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 it's really not a valid argument when you get down to you know who's writing the checks um, and it's the insurance companies. Um, as a result of uh, the George Floyd and the protests here in Pleasanton at this no, a number of city council meetings, the question of oversight of the Pleasanton Police Department came up and I would say the, the oversight of law enforcement in general came up. And I just wanna share the perspective of people in Pleasanton. Um, Pleasanton people think that the police, and I believe they probably think this of the sheriff because of course um, they overwhelmingly voted, they were the only part of the county who overwhelmingly voted to keep Sheriff Ahern in office. Um, who, by the way, once again, because I've had a up front, up front seat, uh, certainly um, his department did need oversight. Um, but you know, the Pleasanton uh, voter thinks that um, law enforcement can do no wrong. We trust our police to police themselves. And that's the narrative that the police gives to the community is that, you know, we earn your trust and that trust you know, you instilled in us so that we, you have the confidence that we can police ourselves. And so consequently, when the topic of oversight comes up of law enforcement in Pleasanton, um, you know, what does that oversight look like? And, I'll, and I know that you just stated, um, and this is, I'm just repeating um, what was said by one city council person uh, a, a current member of this Pleasanton City Council. And as you state that the, the, um, the city to look at for oversight is Oakland. And one city council member has said, well, you know, we certainly don't want any type of pol police commission. All you gotta do is look at Oakland and that's an abject failure. I mean, we, we can all see what's happened there and we don't wanna be Oakland. Um, there's the discussion of an independent auditor 
um, something that uh, you know Palo Alto has, um, and I believe Davis has, and uh, I've heard um, from people who have researched those programs as far as success, uh, that they have been successful. Um, and those independent auditors generally are former law enforcement. And um, so consequently, um, oversight or lack of oversight has fallen to the city council. Um, and at least this current city council is at least um, asking questions of the police department where in the past 20 some years of Pleasanton city council, um, you know, as, as the former city manager called it was, well, the former, the former city council's always had a hands off approach with the police department. Um, and, you know, as I've stated many times, um, you know, Pleasanton, when they use force, um, one in five people get killed. That's 20%. And by comparison, in San Francisco and Oakland, um, the percentages are about one in 100, 1% 1 uh, when San Francisco PD or Oakland PD uses force, um, 1%. John, John yep. I, I'm really sorry. I, I hate to be this person, but we're, we're already running a little bit behind. Okay. So if you have a question, could you yep. ask so it? The, the question is, how do you address and get the support of a Tri-Valley voter, um, you know, who has these types of perspectives. Perspectives. How um, do you get on board? Okay. I'm, I will answer that, but first I wanna tell you how incredibly uh, hard it is to hear your story. And I know how much harder it is for you to live it. And, uh, um, I just want to address what you said about not saving money through lawsuits. The way that those insurance, uh, the way that the insurance works is the more that you're sued, the higher your insurance is. But also the, the more lawsuits there are, the more county council time is being spent, the more sheriff officers and staff time is being spent to address those lawsuits. And I think you rack up $3 million pretty darn fast of direct county money very, very quickly through a series of lawsuits. I'm just, I mean, I, I understand what you're saying about insurance, but it does cost money. And at the end of the day, those lawsuits are about people as it was about your son. And I know that everybody would prefer not to have the lawsuits. This does get to the issue of your, your community and how you talk to the people in this community. I think there is a little bit of a shift. I was out door knocking before this, um, before the last election and People knew about the jail and they knew about the number of deaths in the jail. Now, the number of deaths is just part of the issue. Uh, it, you know, and people were starting to be aware that there was a problem and that was part of the reason Ahern lost. Yeah. When you're talking to random people who are fairly conservative, who, who are saying there's something going on in the jail. And that was beginning to be the conversation. So I actually think there's more support for oversight than you might necessarily expect, especially around the sheriff. Four more people have died so far in 2023 and something is going on. And the people, some of the people who are most supportive of sheriff oversight are these uh, parents of children who have mental health issues, who have been in and out of this jail and other county, you know, other surrounding counties jails. And these people are warriors yeah. and they are very sophisticated about the jails and what's going on and what they need. And they are, they're like, we want somewhere that we can go and, and work to fix things and where we can go and have these conversations. And those people also live in Pleasant. So it's our, our goal is to get those folks and some of the folks who are beginning to see that there is a problem. And it's just a matter of doing the best that we can in terms of raising those issues and then getting the support from everywhere else that we can get. So as soon as we get democratic clubs to pass resolutions, the next goal is to get some of the cities to pass resolutions in support of sheriff oversight. Maybe it won't be pleasant, but we need to go and we need to get whatever cities we can. 
And then we need to get all of the activists just talking to the supervisors over and over again in advance of their election so that they understand this is an issue that is being watched by their constituents. Okay, and uh, go ahead. I'm going to let you We had. Yeah, we have. I, 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 to do with all yeah, I, I just want to say to the folks on Zoom, um, I know Reverend Duran and, and Council Member Testa, you both have your hands up. I would just request um, if we can make it quick because we do need to go to a vote soon and then we have other stuff on our agenda. But Reverend Duran, I see your hand is up. Please go for it. I just want to say that that strong oversight will build community conference, uh, community confidence um, in county law enforcement, but weak oversight would send the wrong message to the residents, uh, and they would see it as a as a paper tiger uh, to prevent genuine transparency, community engagement, and accountability. Just just two things: civilian oversight has often been seen as reactive. Agencies are uh, created after a high-profile incident or scandal, responding primarily to uh, to individual um, complaints, reviews policies as a result of one or more complaints, yada yada yada. However, the over the evolution of oversight, which we which we are now in today, civilian oversight now includes proactive elements, explores problems proactively, investigations, collection of evidence, and an, uh, uh, analyzed data, identifies underlying issues and causes, focuses on organizational change, concentrates on reduction and pre uh, prevention of misconduct, builds partnerships with law enforcement, creates bridges in law enforcement and the greater in the greater community. I would love to see children like, once again say, I would like to be a police officer. I would like to be a fireman. That's what this is all about. That's all. Thank you. And then our last speaker, our question will be from Julie Testa. Hello. Yes. Hi, um, I'm Julie Testa. I'm Pleasanton City Council member. My comments can be shorter because Mr. Bauer already covered so much. Um, and I will first say that I have deep um, respect for Mr. Bauer and his family. And I am a strong supporter of civilian oversight. And in my time on council, it's something that I've been advocating for. And we've had some win in that we have a limited level of oversight now that didn't exist before I was on council. But my my question to you is, it sounds like I, I've been for years um, um, attending conferences on uh, Nicole National Association of, for Civilian Oversight of Law. And um, what I appreciate about their message is that there is not just one form of oversight. And I myself do think that the um, independent auditor where it is a board of um, law enforcement, uh, people with law enforcement background who I think um, understand the complexities of what the department is, needs. Um, and I think hopefully would be received because of that. So is that something that you are promoting is, or are you really um, promoting a very specific form of oversight? Uh, again, Nicole, um, they have on their website, I can't remember how many, but probably close to 10 different forms of oversight that they say, find the one that is appropriate for the community that, uh, so yeah, I are you looking at just the one form that is currently exists in Oakland or would you be receptive to um, looking at a different version? Um, we are not actually looking at, to recreate Oakland. Um, I, I point to Oakland because we have a local version of oversight that's working, right? So that's the that's the reason that I point to Oakland and use it as an example. Um, the fact is that law enforcement has had the opportunity for a couple of centuries now to police itself, 
And what we've really learned over and over and over again is police can't police police. Yes, they know the inner workings, but it's like when you talk to somebody about gun, gun control and they say, do you even know how to load a semi-automatic? It doesn't matter whether I can load a semi-automatic. More people are dying in our county jail proportionally than any other jail in the state. This isn't okay and something is wrong. And the problem with having police oversight and, and that internal mechanism is they are very restricted in what they are willing to look at. The reason that NACOL says let a thousand flowers bloom is because NACOL is literally an organization of every different type of oversight. So they have to say, well, you know, they're, they all have their, their moments. But what we do know is that the limitations of asking police to police police is that over and over and over again, they've been unwilling to sometimes say what is sitting right in front of them. And they are certainly unwilling to look for new, new approaches and new models. And for that reason, I, I, I do not, and the, the people, the, the coalition of organizations that are working to get sheriff oversight, we are seeking actual independent oversight because IAD, Internal Affairs Department, is police, policing, police, and it's not working. People are dying inside the jail. There are problems with the policing. And if we can have a transparent organization that is community driven, we can, we can begin to engage in those discussions. And when there are technical questions that require talking to a law enforcement officer, the oversight board will talk to the sheriff's department and will get the technical information that they need. I applaud your efforts. Thank you so much. I, I agree completely. We um, police should not police themselves. Thank you. Yeah, well structured, well presented. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anne. All right, so I believe how we're going to do this now is for the sake of time and because we are doing this hybrid version, so we have folks in the rooms um, and folks over Zoom, is we're just going to do a voice vote. Uh, so we're going to do support and then oppose and then abstain. Um, I've seen it done. Igor's doing this all the time. Do I see any objections? One, two, three. That's, objections passed. That is that is even that's cleaner. That yeah, that's that's even simpler. Hel Helen, I, I saw you come off off mute. So did, okay. We need a majority vote, so let's take a vote. You go ahead and call it the way you want to do it, sir. All right, let's just, I mean, let's, let's just make it cleaner. Let's just say support, oppose, abstain. That way we just know. Good. Um all right, so all in support, if you're in the room, please raise your hand or, um, and if you're on Zoom, please raise your hand or- Or unmute if you have- Yeah, to. or unmute. Okay, so let's count the numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six. You're a member, right? Yes, my Greg's a member. Six out of seven in the room. All right, and we got five folks um over zoom cool all right so that's 12 okay and then any everybody lower their hand everybody lower your hand anyone opposed please raise your hand right now i think julie i think you still have your hand up right you julie you voted for correct maybe she walked away yeah she may not be there so we're both Let's see. So, uh, I, I just removed it because okay. we had her hand up before. Any any opposed, raise your hand. Yeah, any opposed, raise your hand now. So the motion passes because okay, we yeah. have 12 members. And that means the minimum representation. Just, just really quickly, do we have any abstentions? Raise your hand now if you would like to abstain. Okay, cool. So by a vote of 12 to nothing to nothing, it looks like uh, our support passes for this resolution and uh, for Sheriff Oversight in Alameda County. Very nice. And so that ends 
that agenda item. What do we have next? Okay, next up is uh, Dr. Ronald Lorenz, and we'll walk us through some bylaw changes. And these bylaw changes, we're just kind of matching what the Alameda County um, Party is suggesting that we have in our bylaws. So I'll leave it to Ron, and I will share the changes on the screen here. Good evening, everyone. Nice to see all of these smiling faces and good <laughs> activists here tonight, both in person and online. We have an important decision to make tonight, and this is a decision that affects the ability of the club to be making decisions at the California Democratic Organization level and also the Alameda County Central level. Let me just briefly run through for those people who might not remember or new people who might not know the levels of organization of the Democratic Party. First, there's the, the big organization, which is the nationwide Democratic Party. That's the national organization. And then there's the individual states. So the California Democratic Party or Cal Dems, CA Dems, is the next level down in terms of organization. After that, we move to the county level in California, parishes and various other southern states. And we have in this particular region that affects us, we have the Contra Costa Central Committee, and then we also have the Alameda County Central Committee, which Jackie has served on. And now we have um, a CINA, I believe, uh, who is serving on it for us as representatives. So in order to meet some of the re requisites, in order to have representation at that second level, California Dems, and also the third level, which is the Central Committees, the fourth level are the individual clubs in which we are one of those. So in order for us to be represented in that third and the second level, we have to follow certain requisites and those requisites were changed as of February 23rd when a memo was sent out by the California Democratic Organization. The California Democratic Party says that we must define in our bylaws five individual requisites. These allow us to be able to continue to be certified as a regular club for Alameda County Central Committee, and also to be able to vote on certain things for the California Democratic Organization, including sending members to the state convention coming up in a little over a month, and also some of the other boards which uh, make pre-convention, um, when their committees make recommendations and policy. So just briefly, I'm going to run through those requisites that we were uh, sent on February 23rd, and as the parliamentarian, I was um, allocated the job of making suggestions for us to change our bylaws, which we are to vote on today. Today we vote uh, on take any kinds of input and changes that we might want to make based on my suggestions. Incidentally, my suggestions were um, approved by a voice vote of a subgroup from the TVDC, which voted last month. The executive committee had a Zoom meeting and unanimously voted to accept these changes. So one of them is that we must define what a member of good standing is. The second one is that we must have the members in good standing be certified by one of our um, one of our officers, president, vice president, and um, treasurer. We must submit a 
roster of members in good standing by a specific date. Now that might change year to year. So in our constitution, we have bylaws, we have a recommendation that we just meet that particular deadline, not a specific date, but whatever the county has or whatever the um, uh, state has as a deadline. Okay. And we must have a particular listing of a process in which we vote for our representatives. So that has to be specified. And this also has to be ready for a roster that we put out uh, uh, April 25th, which we send to the Central Committee. So with those recommendations in mind, uh, we have some changes to make to our existing Article 7 in our bylaws. So um, I think most of you have had an opportunity to read or to see what our existing bylaws are as of last year. Okay. And those were voted in last year. Well, the previous one was uh, May 18th, 2020. And then we had another revision of them in March of last year. So we're proposing a very small revision of the bylaws, specifically just relating to the California Democratic Party pre-endorsement process. All right. And that third level, central, the central committees for Alameda and Contra Costa. So we want to be able to deal with those. Ella says that the, this doesn't have anything to do with the central committees. We don't send delegates to the state convention, nor do we send delegates to this process to the central committee. Okay. This All is right. only for pre-primary endorsement caucus delegates. Okay. All right. And, that... and we get one for every 20 members. So the more right. members we get, the more representation that we get. Still an important Still thing. Important. Still a very important thing. So not quite the scope that I uh, had suggested. In any case, there's an article, Article 7, that deals with this pre-endorsement process. Uh, Section 7 is what we're planning to change. And I'm just going to briefly read what we have as the suggested changes, which was uh, voted on unanimously to accept by the executive committee. Okay. California Democratic Party pre-endorsement process. Section seven, when submitting a club roster to the chair of the chartering central committee and or to the cognizant regional director for purposes of the CDP pre-endorsement conference, the roster will contain only members, first edition, who are registered Democrats, second edition, who are, uh, no, existing, who are in good standing, second edition, and who have paid current year dues or have had dues waived due to economic circumstances. Third edition, the status of voting members will be certified by the president, secretary, or treasurer. Fourth edition, voting members must meet these requisites by the deadline specified by the requesting organization. Okay. We then have in this, the existing sections, which says the organization's representatives and alternatives to the pre-endorsement conference will be elected at a general meeting of the organization by a vote of members in good standing in attendance and voting. Members receiving the most votes will be the representatives of the organization. This is the details about how we get representatives elected. One of the requisites from the February 23rd request from the Caldeos. Members receiving the most votes will be representatives of the organization. Alternatives will be the members receiving fewer votes than required to be a representative. The alternates will be considered in descending order of the votes they receive so that those who receive the most votes are given priority. And the fifth edition is the list of representatives to all conferences shall adhere to the equal division rule to the extent possible. Okay, so we have five sentences that meet the four requisites on the California Dems memo, February 23rd. Do we have anybody who has a request for additional wording, change of wording, 
um, explication. Okay, so um, so here on the floor uh, for the live membership, we don't have any uh, any objection to this or any uh, suggested changes. Do we have any online? Can we see some hands of anybody who has questions or makes uh, suggested changes from what the executive board has voted in? I see none. We'll give them a few more seconds to respond. There doesn't appear to be any. So this is actually pretty good and pretty clean. We're gonna get it done and I can stop talking and I can go back and have some coffee. It should be very good because it's good coffee. Thanks to Greg. As usual, thanks to the IBEW for hosting us and putting up some good coffee for me at least. Um, so at this point, what we might want to do is take a vote, a, a voice vote for those in the room and uh, for those that are with us online and see whether this is uh, one of two votes. Okay, this vote is to accept this particular wording. Okay. Then we actually, according to our bylaws, we need in the next meeting or another meeting I to be okay. able to vote. I think we're okay because we did give the membership notice last month. Right. We, um, we sent it out well in advance. We had our internal meeting, which satisfies the two meeting rule. Okay. So I think we would be good here to, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Parliamentarian. We didn't take a vote last week. We did not. So you believe that we should take the vote next month. Yeah, we should take the final vote next month. Okay, it's your call. Yeah, Pete, when do you have to submit the new rules to the Central Committee? 25th? Um, the, the role will have to be set by like May 10th. We have to have all members of the standing. talking about the rules. The, the rules, the uh, they don't technically have to send them until the next chartering they chartered us without these rules in here because these rules came in after we were already accepted for charter so there's no urgency to this there's no urgency i wanted to get it out there so if they looked at us and said no you don't get your representation i wanted to be in 100 percent up to date with bylaw changes so we can um we can do the uh, we could do the vote next majority month. vote now and then we need 66% plus one vote the second round. Okay. But it does specify that we do need to actually take a vote to make a change. And that's at two separate meetings. So let's take a vote. Uh, let's have hands in favor of the existing wording of the proposal. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven uh, out of seven. And online. And online. Is your team? We're going to need one more. We've got three, so we have our minimum of 10. Okay, so we have our form of 10. That's uh, a minimum for the vote. Kevin, Phyllis, and Joan, uh, did you guys want to vote on this bylaws uh, change? We had one and more that was on the screen. Thad and Phyllis are positive, so that's that's two, actually. So we yeah. now have 11. And then and one more we have on the bottom here, which is Helen, so that's 12. And uh, that's 12 positive out of, uh, let's see. And do we have any of those objecting or wanting to change the wording? So hands down for the acceptances. And do we have anybody who's opposed to the existing wording? So we have no opposed, so it's 12 zero, zero. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, folks. I can get back to my wonderful Greg call. So the bylaws passes first pass. Final vote will be next month. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay, the rest of this meeting, we're gonna speed up the pace. Um, so the rest is gonna be pretty much, I think, club business. And next up, our treasurer, as he makes his way up here and Samir, I'm also going to, right after this, see if there's anything you want to share, being membership chair, um, about our members and any plans that you have. So we'll turn it over to Allie. Good evening. I will try to be brief. 
we started out this month, we had $2,845 even. We had income from dues of $360. Our expenses, we had credit card fees, $1,410. Um, media, which is paying for the Zoom, which we're using right now, that's $149.90. $6.80 in meeting supplies and $137 for our post office box for a total of $307.80, meaning we had a profit of $52.20 for the month, leaving us a total at the end of the month of $2,897.20. We, we have 71 members and we have 58 who have not renewed. So if you have a chance and you haven't, please renew. 71, though. We're up from last month. Okay. Alan, is that Zoom yeah. price for a year? Or that's a year. Month? It's a year. Oh, okay. Well, that's a year. Yeah, it's the big cost. And I, I actually ate some of the um, MailChimp costs. I had to, uh, we hit our max this month, so I ended up putting that. That's my gift to the club. No, no, no. But you should just. No, it's only one month because I got it under control now. Just one month. It's okay. Um, Samir. Yeah. Uh, I just want to quick check in with Samir because he's yeah. on here. Yeah. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Sorry. Uh, yeah, I don't have anything specific right now. Um, I'm actually going to reach out to a couple of you to discuss a few things I have. I just, uh, but uh, nothing big, so let's, we'll continue moving. Okay. Thank, Thank you, Samir. We'll, we'll talk uh, soon. Yes, uh, I'll call you tomorrow. Okay, that sounds good. I'm going to go ahead and... Thank um, Hayden, are you on? Hayden Sadoon? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to skip the Central Committee because we kind of talked about the pre-endorsement already. And I will get full details for the pre-endorsement stuff by next month and send it out to members. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our secretary and political director to go through the minutes of last month. Whatever. Yeah. Whatever. Um, as far as what we did last month, um, you remember Pamela Price spoke extensively, and it's all on YouTube. And then um, Rodisha Ransom spoke, and also the chair of the San Joaquin Central Committee endorsed her. I forgot that lady's name. And also Igor spoke about um, uh, the Ukraine. And I'm not sure if we did this last month, but I know that we uh, passed the resolution to support the public bank. I'm not sure if we did it last month or the prior month. Does it really matter? Uh, so that's the secretary's report. The political director's report. I've been working with candidates for a while and I work with them on body language, on their messaging, on uh, how they should be talking to their voters, framing and like that. And in the last three years since I've lost vision in one of my eyes, I've taken to YouTube and I found that there's many political marketing gurus out there, particularly George Lakoff, who I know personally, and Robert Reif, who I would love to know personally, but don't, and somebody named Amy Cuddy, who's uh, an expert on body language. And I put together a uh, a playlist and it's called political marketing gurus and i'll put a link to that in the, the minutes when i send them out but it's for people who are running for office but also people who are involved in campaigns so they can help the people who are running for office who haven't got their act together yet and uh, at this point, there's about 150 videos out there, and I highly recommend them. There's another area that uh, we've, it's kind of the elephant in the room. I know that my friend Alan back there and I were both watching MSNBC and a whole bunch of other places to see what's going on, mm -hmm. frankly, with Trump. 
and with the Republican Party and the mess that they're in. And there's something that I want to recommend to the club members. It's called the Midas Touch Network. Uh, Midas, M-E-I-D-A-S, mm -hmm. uh, as in the king that had the touch and everything turned to gold. And um, they are a bunch of lawyers, uh, attorneys for various people, and some of them uh, are, are quite famous. One of them uh, used to be the number two in the Manhattan DA office. Mm -hmm. And she bring and she did that for 30 years while well, she worked in the DA's office. Okay. And she brings the perspective to all of these legal and litigations. I find it very fascinating. And for the political junkies, check out the Midas Touch Network. Where do we get that? Is that on YouTube? It's all on YouTube. And um, what I'd like to do is ask you to uh, subscribe to the political marketing guru's playlist. Doesn't cost anything to subscribe and you can keep track of what's going on. And also if you know any candidates or are working with any candidates, there it is. Yeah, and I have one comment. We can't put that list on YouTube site simply because our YouTube site is just for videos rather than listings. So if the listings can go into the club page and that's where we can yeah well, well we can have a link from our our website our basic website yes, i did go to our website uh, on our youtube page i did link to your playlist so i think if if you go to our youtube all of your videos that you have been queuing up on your site i've been queuing them up on our well well that's that's about a dozen videos. This is 150 videos ah. in a playlist. And um, maybe when you go online and you get into the YouTube site, I could talk to you and tell you exactly what to do. Okay. Um, any other comments on the report? Um, oh, one other thing uh, to clarify this thing about the pre-primary endorsement caucus. Yes, we get one delegate to the pre-primary endorsement caucus for every 20 members in the club, but they can't live everywhere. It, in our case, it's everybody who lives in AD 20, excuse me, AD 16, which is Rebecca Bauer Cahan. But if you live in Oakland or in Stockton or in some other place around, like Igor may belong to our club. Uh, I know Robin Torello belongs to our club. Igor. She doesn't count toward that 20 because she lives in, I believe, San Leandro or Hayward. Yeah, she doesn't. Yeah, and, and that's part of the thing that we need to do as a membership is to send that list. And I have a lookup table that does all that and it says exactly what district they're in. and. We have to report all that to the central committee. So that's part so, of what they so will be. Alan was so saying 71, but was that the number you had? Right. And certification, which would be great if you have that table already. So, I have it all built. So hopefully the 71 at most will get us three delegates yeah. because we would have 60 within well, AD 16. Yeah. Anyway, that's very important. Thank you. Um, and I, and we are starting to run out of time, so I don't know if any of the other chairs, Ron, did you have anything else um, that you would like to share as a chair? Yes, I do. Okay, why don't you come on up? And also Sharon, then you're also a chair, so I'll let you so go after. I, maybe we can have Sharon come first, and then we can have a discussion as to, to the holiday party, which is something that I would like to okay. discuss too. What I was thinking of is why didn't you come up here so we can so the mic picks you up? Hi. And they can see your pretty face. Why don't you come around this way? So uh as far as right now, um I've been thinking about a holiday party and I think at the end of this month, we'll have a discussion about it. I'll talk to the officers of the club and we'll work on it. 
So we're thinking about a picnic, summer picnic, maybe? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think we should have another summer picnic. You know, there's some concern that the membership is down and it might not have a lot of people. Well, let's think about it. This is one way to build membership and to bring in families. And we had an awful lot of good ball at the last this fifth last year. We had uh, 20 to 25 candidates who came. The picture that we gave, we had live music. We had wonderful food with some great tri-tip provided by Jackie. And everybody brought food and it was just a wonderful event. We had over a hundred people. And okay, if you don't get that many people, so what? Really, we got $125 for Heritage Park in Dublin. Do we think since we have all the exec most of the executive? Yeah, picnic, do we think do we think we want a picnic? Do you want a picnic at the end of June? Maybe June 25th, which is a June is hard for me because we're out of town uh, two weekends that month. So July would be better for me or August or September. <laughs> June well, is tough. So we're going to have a June meeting. Usually summer's hard to get people because yeah. they're out of town. Yeah. What, Richard? Uh, I was going to say, we can table this for... Yeah. Like, yeah, we'll have a conference call. It sounds like it yeah, yeah. Yeah. may need a little more discussion with our... So maybe, I'll set up of, maybe the end of this month, because then I can make reservations if we want. I'll, I'll set up a call within the next week or two, and I also want to set up a call for the UDC. I'm hoping you folks could help me with a fundraiser for the UDC as well. Yeah. <laughs> a, a local UDC you're talking about? Yeah, I'm market? still the chair of the Tri-Valley UDC with Alameda County. Yeah, well, maybe okay. that could be good. Maybe it could, but I don't want to short the club. Um, you know, I, I we, we can discuss it. It was fine. Yeah, I'll set up a, I'll set up a call and we can discuss. Okay. You can see upstairs. Right. Okay. Thank you. Briefly, as the entertainment committee chair, I want to say that um, we've had some fun and we've had some good uh, music, and I've provided uh, both the band and some individual performances by other. Uh, musicians that I'm associated with, and I want to continue to volunteer for no charge, although I pay the musicians myself out of my pocket. Um, cost me just a couple, $300 uh, per session for me to pay for the musicians, but I'm volunteering uh, my band again to pay uh, to play at the uh, holiday picnic if we have one. And also Jackie's good idea to have a UDC fundraising committee. I'm also volunteering my band at my expense to be able to uh, play at uh, the UDC uh, picnic. And I will help um, with the uh, hospitality uh, on that uh, picnic also, because I'm a big fan of having get togethers outside and families. And it does, I think, bring a sense of spirit community and kind of family. To the, to the club, which I'm in favor of promoting as strongly as we can. So I'm willing to put my money and my band and my bad voice uh, towards that uh, effort. Thank you, Ron. I like the voice. Oh, <laughs> it's nice. <laughs> um, any other um, business from the club? Anybody online? Raise your hand. Any members here in the room? And I'm just going to end then with. Sorry. Oh, yes. Yes, please. Please do. It's not officially club business, but I just want to make it. Yeah. Um, first of all, I want to recognize Barbara for being here because I. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm glad Barbara can come to could come to another meeting. Um, I, I love having you here, and I know you don't have to be here on, on a Monday night, but it's great to have you here. <laughs> we appreciate you. And then, um, uh, I will... Richard, could you? I don't know. <laughs> so Barbara was at our, our last meeting uh, last month. Barbara Sasto, she is the chair of the San Joaquin County Democratic oh, Central okay. Committee. Sorry. Yes, and I have a card. So... <laughs> and we're certainly hoping, especially with 
uh, State Senate District 5 now being part of both counties, that there will be future opportunities to collaborate more, because uh, uh, that would be a great partnership to have. Um, but what I wanted to make announcement on was, um, as folks may be aware, uh, there are certain individuals and certain organizations and folks in Alameda County who, um, let's just say, have not been very kind to DA Pamela Price uh, since she's been elected. She's facing a lot of pushback, um, a lot of, yeah, yeah, it's it's not great, um, but there will be a rally outside the Alameda County Superior Courthouse in Oakland this upcoming Sunday, April 23rd. It will be at 4 p.m. Um, I know a couple of other groups are trying to push folks out um, in support of DA Pamela Price, and she will be there. She will speak. Um, but it's just, it's something that people want to put together to support her as she's Good. facing some very unfair and negative, I guess, press coverage and, and things. So, uh, yeah, I just want, if anybody's interested in that, it will be April 23rd, this Sunday, at the Alameda County Superior Courthouse in Oakland at 4 o'clock. Uh, Richard? Yes. Tell them to that. I had a conversation with Julie Testa, who is maybe still on Zoom, about possible advice for Pamela Price. And if you remember when she was here last month, I said that one of the first things that Dinah Becton did when she became Contra Costa DA was hire some PR people to work for the DA's office. And I have to tell you, from a marketing guy's standpoint, it's direly needed. She needs a PR person to make her case. She can't make that alone. And I have, I've been watching on TV. I've been watching on YouTube. I've been reading the papers. She really needs a PR person. If you're connected to her office and her campaign, please tell her that. Because she can't be being the DA and all organizing, I think it's 400 people that work for her, be the boss of 400 people and running her own PR program. That doesn't happen in the corporate world. They have a separate PR group usually, and that's what she needs. Can't be a lawyer. So I second that emotion. Yeah. <laughs> well, a, a disclaimer, I, I don't really have any connections with with DA Price or her, her office, um, but that's a good thought. Um, I'm sure you have her contact info as well. If you want. Well, I, I made that suggestion to her face to face, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Anyway, that was my announcement. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Richard. And and you know, I hear I hear some discussions here in the background, and and if somebody does want to bring a resolution or something to membership then I encourage you to write it up and send it so that we can submit it to all membership. Um, but uh, that's it for now on that. Um, just to closing, um, Marilyn left me a couple of haikus. I'm not much of a reader, but haikus are real short, aren't they? <laughs> And she has some lovely pictures of flowers and stuff. Now, Marilyn walks and takes a nature journal all the time and posts beautiful stories of her walks. So her haikus are also based on nature. So I'm just gonna read a couple. Bright pink tassels from a Spanish sombrero hang on a eucalyptus. Ooh. Haiku one. <laughs> And poppy petals curled up tight against cold and wind from a spring snowstorm. So she has some beautiful stuff. I will share her poems and I wanna thank her for attending. She had another meeting and was able to squeeze this in. Thank you, thank you. And um, that concludes our meeting uh, this month. Um, stay tuned for next month's. Uh, we plan to have some city council members here next month and mayors. And thank you all for attending. And the kid can stop. Good stuff. Thank you all. Good night. I read that. You wrote it on plastic.